Thank you, Frank. I won't reprise my introduction earlier because most of the people were here this morning and we need to move on. I'd just like to welcome Dr Small again to the podium and he's going to speak on distributism in Henry George and since I am quite ignorant of Henry George, I'm going to learn a great deal. Thank you. Please welcome Good afternoon again. Um, it was interesting uh, hearing Father uh, Stenhouse speaking today about the way that people get forgotten. G.K. Chesterton, I'm told, resurrected an obscure person by the name of Charles Dickens who had been forgotten. And so you have really quite brilliant people who just kind of fade off the, uh, the map, so to speak. And um, that is pretty much the story of our time to a certain extent. Uh, I'm going to be introducing or talking about Henry George. Now, Father uh, was very discreet. He kept talking about single tax and so on, which is actually code language for the people that aren't allowed to say it in public. Uh, so when you hear the word Henry George, it's single tax, it's sort of all related together. Um, I'm by no means, by the way, the expert on Georgism here. I think Henry George Pierce, uh, even um, uh, uh, Dr. Bolan, um, John Young that we have, are all experts in this area. I've been fond of um, Henry George for some time. I think I've probably introduced more George's concepts into my programs at UTS. Henry George is little known name today, perhaps not unlike G.K. Chesterton among the wider community, but in his, in his time he exercised a great influence on a great number of people in the area of economics. By the way, I'm just going to break here. Can I just have a show of hands? Look at a little straw poll, right? How many people feel as though they're pretty comfortable or pretty familiar with the name Henry George? It's just hands. Okay, so I've probably got about uh, maybe a quarter of people here. Okay. A few guys. That's why we're here. Right. <laughs> well, a fair bit of what I'm going to say will probably be a little bit familiar, but I'm trying to put a little bit of a twist in it. And um, anyway, so away we go. But it's kind of good because I can just kind of gauge where we're going with, 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 the, uh, with the audience. To, to put him into perspective, so great was his influence in the USA um, to that, uh, at that time, or when he passed away, uh, that his funeral rivaled that of Abraham Lincoln's. And in fact, it may have been the largest uh, funeral in the history of the United States to that date. Uh, so he wasn't an obscure person in his time. Henry was not a professional economist. And you'll notice this morning I said that they're my favourite type of economist but a journalist and an editor. Sort of reminds you of somebody. Uh, at, at this, he was perhaps comparable to William Cobbett in England and Chesterton himself. All three applied common sense to the world about them, and all three came to conclusions that challenged the dominant thinking of that world. George's interest in economics was perhaps stimulated by his personal experiences of poverty, uh, which caused his first years of marriage. He was married in 19, uh, 1861, uh, and uh, he had to beg for food when his um, first child was quite young. However, he soon found himself uh, working as, in a newspaper with, as a printer and very, very shortly after really revealed, revealed his talents as a writer and a thinker. And within a very few years, um, he was uh, eventually an editor uh, and a time a uh, newspaper owner. George did not leave his fondness for the poor behind him as he became successful. And his economics is largely focused on the problem of poverty, as it existed amongst the most developed communities of his time. The anomaly of um, crippling poverty existing within the most uh, developed cities in the English-speaking world gave rise to George's most famous work, Progress and Poverty in which he examined the problem of modern poverty and suggested a remedy for its elimination. He saw cities as they became more economically developed, more economically powerful, as being the homes to the, the, the most abject and wretched poverty. He thought, well, there has to be a solution to this. It didn't seem quite right. G.K. Chesterton was really concerned with the same problem, which is probably why he resurrected um, Charles Dickens. <coughs> 
and along with uh, Belloc, um, identified a simil similar causal factor, although their remedy differed substantially from George. George was a humanist deist, and while his writings often can resemble Protestant acknowledgement of God within the workings of creation, he was deprived of the insights and intellectual depth of genuine Christian tradition. This lacuna seems to have resulted in his system of economics having more of a debt to Adam Smith than to Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas, which remains one of its weaknesses. The strength of George's economics lies in his recognition that land competes with labour for the enjoyment of the benefits of economic production. Economic production is the result of the application of labour to raw materials. Uh, those people who are familiar with the Georgist world, you'll see the next few paragraphs, very, very familiar. Um, economic production is the result of the application of labour to raw materials for the provision of the products that serve the material needs of human society. Economic production is social and because it's concerned with satisfying the material needs of society, not the individual. If I mow my own lawn, I'm, you know, it's a hobby. If I mow somebody else's lawn, it's an income. It's part of the economy. The fact that products are the result of labour being applied to raw materials means that there is a need, uh, there is a need for a, distribu a distribution of the benefits of the production between the factors that produce it. These are the raw materials uh, and the labour. In the lexicon of economics, the term land refers to anything that comes from nature. In addition to actual land, uh, the factor of production called land includes air, water, space, radio frequency, bandwidth, minerals, animals, natural vegetation. Land for the economist is anything whose existence has not required the addition of human agency. This definition of land is key to the understanding of both the economics of Henry George and the distributism of uh, G.K. Chesterton and Belloc. Both recognise, or all of them recognise, that the treatment of land property is a major component in the economic system. Simply put, land and labour compete for the proportion of the benefits of the production uh, that they enjoy. This is known as the problem of distributive justice. How are the benefits of production distributed between the owners of land and the owners of labour. Expressed in this way, it is visibly a question of property rights. What is the nature and value of property rights in land and how do they compare to the nature and value of property rights in labour? It turns out that property rights in labour are easily resolved from elementary metaphysics, a thing that naturally, a thing that naturally belongs to its causes. Labour is the effect of humans applying themselves to some activity. That activity would not exist without the human causes. Therefore, it belongs to it, naturally. This is expressed in Holy Scripture in the various places where it is recognised that the labourer deserves his wages. In a sense, Holy Scripture also asserts that the natural ownership of the land residing, uh, uh, residing in its maker when Moses uh, relays the words of God in Leviticus 25, the land is mine. Since God made the world and everything in it. The logic of this passage from Leviticus does not need revelation, since it is really only a fact from not natural theology. That is, from the existence of the world, which is definitely contingent, one must conclude an unmade maker, which exists outside the created order, and as its maker, is its owner. This natural logic, found in the religious traditions of customary peoples and non-Christian religions, such as Islam, as well as Christianity. The communication of God's natural property rights to human owners is problematic. Indigenous people tend to overcome this by traditional beliefs that involve their creator spirits giving property rights to the people, their tribes, contingent, dependent, on them upholding their laws and traditions. Leviticus 25 is just an example of this type of conditional transfer, if we read more of Leviticus 25. 
although it does have the distinction of involving the one true God. A commonality between the customs that are found across the various places where this conditional transfer is found, including Leviticus 25, is that they all tend to include mechanisms for preventing the concentration of land property into the hands of a small sector of society for its disproportionate benefit at the expense of everyone else. And I do recommend, if you're interested, go back to Leviticus 25, and you'll see an extraordinarily interesting theory of property value and also a strategy for keeping land concentration at bay. Um, something that I like to show my students from time to time. More sobering uh, is the tendency articulated by Carl Zimmerman uh, or uh, for societies or even entire civilizations to collapse, especially uh, when wealth, especially in land, concentrates disproportionately. The disordered concentration of wealth is the enemy of society. The Catholic Church has a long tradition in understanding these mechanisms. It has made private property the key element in its moral tradition and a key to its social thought. Christian feudalism was a mechanism for ensuring this uh, because, it's, because of its understanding that monarchs, although nominally the owners of all the land in their realms, had an obligation before God to use the wealth in some way for the good of the governed. Simply put, the Catholic monarch knew that if he did not use his land wealth appropriately, he would be guilty of theft with a very dismal prognosis for his re eternal reward. And of course, that did not stop the feudal nobility uh, for falling foul of the corruption from time to time, but it did emphasise the important importance of praying for Christian leaders. The 16th century can be viewed partly as a battle over property rights. The German princes who patronised Luther did so to get God off their backs and so to be left to enjoy their property riches without their obligations before God. Henry VIII did similar in England, though his object was more to buy with economic favours the support of his nobility for his murderous marital adventures. Max Weber correctly identified capitalism as, the, as originating from the emerging Protestant ethic because it freed the economically powerful from the moral obligation not to oppress the economically weak. Pope Benedict XVI reminded the world that justice is a gift that the strong give to the weak. He was echoing a tradition that runs through the entire Catholic social tradition. Henry George was not aware of this tradition. Uh, growing up, as he did, in a Protestant environment in 19th century United States of America. He was aware, however, of the economic problems that attended the concentration of private property in land. Unlike Proudhon uh, and Marx, who concluded that private property itself was an evil, George distinguished that it was not the private property per se that was the problem, but only the misuse of private property in land. Furthermore, he was able to distinguish between ownership and use in a way that was consistent with the Catholic moral tradition. St Thomas Aquinas had articulated a theory of uh, property that permitted its private ownership, but insisted that in some way its use must be common. In this way, he was only developing Aristotle, who posited his dual theory of ownership private ownership with common use, which has been the consistent position of the Catholic Church. His understanding of a property is therefore not narrowly Catholic religious belief, but an objective conclusion regarding the natural moral law. Capitalism involves a collection of violations of the natural law, which is why it can only flourish where Catholicism is weak. Conversely, as capitalism flourishes, Catholicism weakens. They are at war, and have been at war since the beginning. At our part of history, capitalism is strong, and the Catholic Church, regrettably, is fast fading into irrelevance. 
Michael Hoffman outlined the way that the erosion of the morality of usury was accompanied by the first introduction of modernism into the Catholic Church. Reading the experiences of St Peter Canisius, as I mentioned before earlier today, uh, tended to confirm Hoffman's conclusions. All this is complicated by the difficulties today of even defining capitalism and uh, even more by the way that conservatives in the church have gravitated to it as the polar opposite of socialism. What is capitalism? To answer that question, we need to begin with Adam Smith's recognition that there are three fundamental factors of production, land, labour and capital. Now, we've already uh, defined land, everything that exists that hasn't had humans contributing to its existence. Labour uh, is human effort in any of the ways that humans apply their bodies and minds to producing useful things. And capital is that collection of human products that aid the productive effort. These three compete uh, for the share of the economic products and they contribute, uh, that they contribute to in what is known as the problem of distributive justice. If the problem of distributive justice, it's almost as hard to say as distributism, is allowed to work itself out, the allocations tend to go to the weaker factors of production at cost and to the strongest factor which takes the residue. For example, if a product can be sold for $100 and the three factors of production have equal costs of $30, then the two weaker factors will be paid $30 each and the strongest factor will take the remaining 40. Capitalism is that situation where capital takes the $40 and labour and land take $30 each. In practice, the strongest factor tends to press the others down. We can ask, what is the cost of labour? It is the cost to keep a human family alive and flourishing to the point it can reproduce itself over time. In Catholic social thought, this is known as the living wage. However, humans are resourceful creatures. If you cut their wages, they tend to work out ways of staying alive and even how to continue having families, even though those families become progressively more wretched as wages are driven down. And we certainly saw that through 18th and 19th century England. Karl Marx argued that it was capital that was the strongest fa factor in the competition for the big share. He was wrong uh, because his definitions were wrong, but he was close. He made the mistake of thinking that land and true capital, and for that matter money, which is not capital at all, were all species of capital. Most economic students are taught this, by the way, today. He coined the term capitalism on that basis, and we have had it ever since. Just as an aside, does anybody know where we get income tax from? Karl Marx. The uh, Catholic Church avoided Marx's term for a long time, preferring the expression liberalism, taking target on British liberalism, the opinion that happened to give us our Liberal Party in Australian politics. His solution was to demand the violent socialisation of all productive capital, which is a remedy more toxic than the problem itself. Henry George took a different view, uh, which was somewhat closer to the mark. He recognised that it tended to be the factor of land that discreetly took the lion's share of the distribution pie. His goal was to leave the business owners and the labourers to flourish. So he's a capitalist. No, really. um, by removing a landlord's excessive economic power, he was not, plan he was not planning a forced uh, confiscation of land, land ownership the way that the socialists were, but he did want landowners not to profit excessively from, uh, at the expense of others engaged in the economy. His strategy can be understood by, again, using a little metaphysics. George accepted that private property was licit and that it should be protected, but he noted that the value of actually using the land was largely dependent 
on the surrounding human community. For example, a house at Palm Beach can be yours for somewhere around million, no, sorry, about three, three and a half million. I just went to... Uh, but a similar house at Naruma, still on the beach, costs about 450000 And one at Eden costs even less. The houses are all the same. The beaches are all the same. What is different is that one is on the edge of the four and a half million people that comprise the most important city in the country. Now for the metaphysics. A thing naturally belongs to the causes that contribute to it. A worker has natural ownership to his work, which he then sells to his employer for wages. In the case of the price of the land at Palm Beach, its cause is the community called Sydney. Without that cause, the land would be worth what it is at Eden, or perhaps even less. Because even Eden has a town wrapped around every house in it. A house in some desolate part of the remote Australian coastline, maybe on a similarly beautiful beach, say North and Western Australia or the Great Australian Bight, we would hardly be worth more than the building materials in it, and often somewhat less. George may not have had the benefit of St Thomas's metaphysics, but he had the common sense to guess its implications. If the community was the cause and therefore the natural owner of land value, as distinct from the land itself, then the community had natural ownership in the value that it had imparted to the land. Furthermore, in a very real sense, if the community caused the land value, but it was denied its natural right to it, then the result was theft. This is quite distinct from the ownership of the land itself. The usefulness of a block of land to support a house or a farm, and so on. On the other hand, the community has certain costs associated uh, with it that must be financed in some ways. The common way to do that is through taxation. But experience has shown that taxation is never popular and often results in weird and complex inequalities. George's solution to those two puzzles was almost too obvious. If the community was the natural owner of land value and it needed money to fund community services, then collecting the land value would give to the community what naturally belongs to it and pays for the community services with no need for taxation. You've heard the expression single tax. Father Stenhouse gave it to us. That's what he was talking about. All this resulted in Henry George's remedy for the economic injustices found in Western societies. The value of land can be expressed in terms of its rental value. And that rental value can replace most, if not all, of the other forms of taxation. I did this calculation about 25 years ago when I was really excited about this, and um, it turns out that it does a lot more than that. We only need one tax. The transition to a Georgist economy is tricky, but um, we will consider that separately. For the present, I would like us to imagine what living in a Georgist economy would look like. The ACT was actually set up as uh, to be a Georgist economy. And from, again, Father Stenhouse's talk this morning, you can understand where that sort of came from. And if you want to read more about it, if you can find a copy, there's a brilliant book, um, Canberra in Crisis by... Help me, John. Canberra in Crisis, who wrote it? Oh, I can't remember. It's, it's a marvellous book. I'm fortunate enough to have ended up with a, a, a copy of it. Um, dismal if you've ever lived in Canberra. Anyway, that's getting off the point. The, um, the ACT was, uh, uh, for political reasons, it never, got, it never quite got working properly. And from about 1970 onwards, it was in practice hardly different to any other city. Uh, to give you an idea, from about 1970 onwards, even though you rent your land in Canberra, the rental value costs less than local government rates in most other cities. Hardly market rental. It was a failure. However, the concept was good. Frank Brennan. Frank Brennan? Um, so for those people who like history of economics and stuff, um, great book. Uh, 
But most people know that in Canberra you rent your land and pay for the house uh, that you build on it. Now let's imagine if that was really working, it was working in Sydney. If that happened in Sydney, the average house that currently costs about $950,000 would only cost the value of the house itself, say about a quarter of a million dollars, 250, something like that, you can build a house for quite comfortably. Alternatively, the average rent in Sydney is about $28,000 per annum, which means the rent on the land is about $21,000. I'm going to get into some numbers here, so I hope I don't sort of drive you a little bit, you know, I could do it on a blackboard or something. Um, now, three numbers. If Sydney was managed like Canberra and was set up to run, uh, so, well, if uh, Sydney was managed like Canberra, uh, at least as Canberra was originally set up to run, the average house would not be the 950, it would be 250. You should be paying for the house and then you'd be renting the land and you'd have an annual rental of about $21,000. Okay, bear with me for the numbers. And that land rent would go to the government. A family renting that house would still be paying the $28,000 in rent, the way they are at present, but they would not need to pay income tax or GST or other minor taxes. If their household income was, let's say, about $80,000, which is actually a little bit higher than the average in Sydney at present, they would be saving about $17,500 in income tax and at least another $3,000 or so in GST. The overall income to the government is comparable, but their spending power of that family is about $20,000 higher. The higher wage will improve their standard of living, probably make it affordable to have children, which will be a pleasant change at this point in history, and stimulate many parts of the local economy. Better still, if that family wanted to use its extra income to buy their own house, they would only need to save the price of the house itself, about 250000 in the example. And their home would be theirs. That could take years less to save with their extra $20,000 uh, than most um, Sydney families spend paying off their mortgages. There are other advantages as well. In Georgia's economies, land tends to be used more efficiently and property prices tend to stay lower because there is less incentive to invest in speculative investments. Therefore, investors tend to be, the investment tends to be directed towards employment-generating business applications, and the higher disposable income across the community stimulates local production and businesses. So employees, families are better off, businesses are better off, the economy is better off, there's someone cut out of this, by the way, but uh, I'll, I'll take a straw poll later on and see if anyone's spotted it. However, there are some powerful shortcomings with, in a Georgist world that have tended to make it unpalatable. The most obvious, at least for existing property owners, is the transition into the Georgist system. If I own a house in Sydney today worth a million dollars, I will not enjoy seeing its value fall to a quarter of that. <laughs> Especially if I then also have to pay the government its ground rent as well. Most Australians dream of owning their own home, and even more of making money merely by owning it. In a Georgist world, you make your money by working, or by running a productive business. We have become used to believing that we deserve reaping in the capital gain on our own house, even though we do nothing to cause it. When I was first looking at real estate, back in the 1970s, a house in my suburb cost about $30,000. Today, that same house, perhaps with a renovated bathroom and kitchen, is worth a million dollars and costs a bigger multiple of the average wage. In other words, it is considerably less affordable, even though it's 50 years older. I like that because it has made living in that suburb... Oh, sorry, I... No. That suits me because I own a house in that suburb. However, 
It has made living in that suburb a lot harder for my children. In a subtle but very real way, I have benefited at the expense of my children. A subtle exploitation of the next generation, but a very real one. And to a certain extent, too many of us in the room have probably taken it for granted. Don't stone me. <laughs> Most people do not see that. And they definitely would not vote to see it stopped especially if it stopped suddenly. In addition, most people who get moderately wealthy by hard work and running productive businesses tend to put their spare wealth into real estate, where it will work very hard for them, but without them having to work nearly so hard themselves. Those near the top of that pile are also willing to put a lot of money into keeping that nice labour-free means of making money working for them. That money can be very effective in political activities to stop George's innovations. Mason Gaffney um, explored how that money was also responsible for the development of the discipline of economics over the last century. And if any of you have children studying economics, the only problem with Gaffney's work, by the way, has got an absolutely dreadful title, which makes me kind of embarrassed whenever I, I refer to it. It's simply called The Corruption of Economics. And I, I find books with titles like The Corruption of, you know, you think this is sort of some rag crank kind of thing, right? But the book is actually excellent because it's basically the history of how American universities got their economics professors, how American universities were owned largely by their... Um, railway barons, and when the universities went to hire people to teach economics, if they didn't teach the kind of economics that made by the railway barons look like fine upstanding citizens, they didn't get a job. Today, if you go to university or to school, you're taught Chicago School Economics. And the only reason we have Chicago School Economics is because the money that's put those people in over the last century or so to basically make sure that nobody learns economics as it really is as a science. It's something else. Okay. Bit off script there. Um, it is combined to move us for further from George's principles than towards them. And property has become especially unaffordable over the last half century. This is not new. The last five centuries can be viewed as a massive trend away from the Georgist concept of land and public funding. Historically, medieval feudalism operated implicitly on a Georgist land system. The king earned the rent of the kingdom and used it to fund everything from the army to fixing the roads. Much of the land the king did not own often earned rent for the monasteries. And they supplied education, a lot of health care, and even support for the poor. To the extent that in Henry's Merry England, when he ran around sacking the monasteries, the universities at Cambridge and Oxford almost failed because they no longer had students sort of coming from the little monastery schools around the country. It didn't cost the locals very much. The Reformation was a strategy for undoing all that and it has been very successful. It is not the purpose here to try and cover all the technicalities, but merely to introduce the general concepts. Georgism is meant to protect private businesses and, in fact, supports it. In this, it differs mass massively from socialism. In its early days, it was confused with socialism, and which was not very helpful. Even Pope Leo XIII, appeared uh, to take aim at it as part of his rejection of socialism in Rerum Novarum. But it is apparent that he was not well briefed on the necessary distinctions. It draws out one of the curiosities of capitalism, in that capitalism likes to hide its rapacious heart behind the defence of private enterprise. Genuine private enterprise is a good and a necessary part of a just and prosperous economy but only so far as its participants understand the moral law 
as it pertains to economic matters. In the 13th century, most people understood those moral principles, even the people who cheated. They knew that they either went to confession or they went to hell. <laughs> Today, almost nobody knows them, including Catholics. We have a battalion of well-funded Catholics promoting the idea that capitalism is the will of God, something that Pope Pius XI warned about in the strongest terms. That group in the church does not like Georgism at all. About as much as it does not like Chesterton's distributism. With regard to land, distributism achieves what much, much of what a Georgia system would also achieve. To relate the two, a distributist land system would see widely distributed private property. But it would still benefit, I believe, from a Georgist overlay of land value taxation. On the other hand, Henry George's chief insight and strength concerned the land problem, uh, which he mastered admirably. However, Chesterton also recognised other areas of the economy that needed an active moral restraint, such as in the areas of the operations of business and especially shops. Henry George ventured into these areas of the economy, especially in his latter work, The Science of Political Economy. However, while it tried to grapple uh, with the flaws in other parts of the economy, it was not nearly as cohesive or persuasive as it needs to be. Uh, this may have been due to George's dependence on Adam Smith. In the 20th, the 20th century began with strong support for Henry George. However, the late 20th century has seen a progressive diminution of interest in him. The 20th century did see considerable uh, interest in various attempts to correct the general economic dysfunction identified by Pope Leo XIII. Apart from Chesterton's distributism and George's solution to the land problem, there was also the movement known as social credit, originated by the British engineer Major C.J. Douglas. Social credit focused on the problem of money and indirectly on the problem of usury. All three had strong followings, and this should be no surprise, especially when one notes that Chesterton's distributism, despite being concerned with property, tended to be associated in practice with promoting small business and the question of trade. As a set, each tended to focus on one of the three major economic moral issues considered by St Thomas and pretty clearly understood in the 13th century. As the 20th century progressed, the idea that economics has no moral content has taken hold. This has been obscured by the way that scientific and technological advances have enabled the general society to progress, even while economic um, distribution and dysfunction has been creeping deeper. In the last 50 years especially, only a very small part of the scientific and technological advances have actually reached the common man. For this I'll just, I was studying Master of Commerce in about 80, 1980, and at that point, one of the debating points, the questions that we were sort of throwing around in organisation behaviour, was what was going to happen by the turn of the century, right, because these organisational theorists were looking at the way that productivity was increasing so much that we're going to be able to do all the things we needed to do today and better with a lot less work. And the question we were debating, it was about 90, oh, sorry, 81, 82, was how were we going to adjust organisationally, like corporate organisations, to a three-day week? Yes. Right? Alvin Toplar and all that sort of stuff. Remember? Yes, I do. Right? How many people have got a problem with what to do with the extra two days off? Right. Come back to that from time to time. Talk to students about it. They go, oh, what do you want to about? Crazy man, small. Yeah. But then they invented technology. Well, it's not just technology. It's just that there is a bleed. Right. Somewhere there is an awful lot of the wealth we're producing bleeding off. Not necessarily very visibly. Okay. And we can talk about that later on as we go along. It's certainly there. Because, okay, the technology might be a distraction and so on. But did you know that today we spend a lot less uh, money, a lot smaller proportion of our pay packet on our gadgets? 
Okay? And some of you guys will remember that if you bought, let's say, something to play records or the radio on and put it in your lounge room, it was a, it was a, it was a great thing, wasn't it? Right? The proportion of your wages that you went into buying that stereogram, I think, was there, you know, novel, high tech, 1970, right? <laughs> Compared that to the price of what makes the same sort of sound uh, for people today, right? Uh, and we can go through food is cheaper, clothing is cheaper, motor cars are even cheaper. No, okay. the gadgets lasted longer then. They didn't change every few years. Well, we, we, we didn't have... Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll get right off the topic if I go into that. <laughs> <laughs> Just hold this idea. There's something is dribbling off somewhere. Okay. Although Chesterton and Belloc were perhaps the most rounded of the three systems, distributism was perhaps the least developed in terms of its theoretical complexity and depth. This is not to say that distributism has not had major impacts and successes. However, of the three... Georgism is perhaps the most developed and the most amenable to inclusion into modern economies. It suits integration into public policy and its mechanisms are easily accommodated within the educational and governmental institutions. As long as we get rid of the Chicago School of Economics. If a Georgist land system was implemented, it is possible that attention uh, would be turned towards other means of profiting without effort. So eventually, other area, the areas of trade and the question of money, usury, would also need to be controlled. Of these, money is the most troublesome. Uh, but that must be left as a topic for another day. Overall, it illustrates how the Catholic intellectual tradition continues to provide the framework uh, for most fundamental aspects of all solutions to the economic problem. That tradition has been strong and civilising. It means that when we look out on the economic instabilities and inequalities that surround us, we should not be too smug. Yes, the world is in an economic mess. And property prices in Australia are getting inhuman. And yes, the Catholic Church does have the answers in its old books, even if it took the day as Henry George to work out a very practical way to solve it <laughs> in a quasi-Catholic manner. But the reason for the chaos and the unpopularity of common sense in the marketplace is the failure of the church to hold its own moral ground and to teach it. St Thomas holds the keys, but hardly anyone teaches him anymore. So despite the goodwill of many emerging young minds, their solutions are often too limited or worse. Most are being shipwrecked on one or other of the twin shipwrecks of faith, often before they even start their professional careers. If the West is to survive, this must be reversed. Thank you. Sure.